All right, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about position. Before we get into that, we need to talk about exactly what position means because in reference to objects in your picture plane, we can be referring to a few different things when we say position. Position can mean the orientation or rotation of an object. Which way is the shape facing? Up, down, left, right, diagonally? Uh, we can be referring to its position or location on the picture plane, so where it's oriented on the two-dimensional plane on your format. <clears throat> and we can also talk about um, its position in relation to proximity, how close or far away it is to other objects on the picture plane. So let's start with orientation and rotation. Here's an image of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Uh, we've looked at the pyramids before, um, very powerful design being used here, so you know we're going to look at it again. In ancient Egypt, there was the sun god, Ra. Um, there were a bunch of different gods. Um, Ra was a really important one, and you'll notice this element above his head here. This is the sun disk, uh, also called Aten. It is a part of Ra. It is one of his symbols, one of his forms. Um, so around 1350 BCE, a new pharaoh came into power called Akhenaten, uh, which means son of Aten, and he unified Egypt uh, under a monotheistic religion, uh, worshipping Aten, um, which was just one aspect of Ra, but sort of all of the gods in this polytheistic religion in ancient Egypt became absorbed into a singular god, Aten. Uh, this is a symbol of Aten shown here uh, with the sun and the rays of light emanating from it. The pyramid then is actually an image of Aten's rays or Ra's rays emanating down to us. This triangle shape pointing up to the heavens or rays emanating down from the heavens to us. So here is a shape that is associated with a male or masculine god. Here is a bust of Akhenaten's wife, Nefertiti. This bust contains a very powerful shape within it, uh, this inverted triangle, uh, this shape pointed down. So here is that same shape, the triangle again, but its orientation has been changed. And this is actually true throughout many different cultures um, across the world and across time, that the triangle facing up is a symbol of masculinity. It is phallic, a representative of Father Sky pointing up above us. And the inverted triangle pointed down to Earth or Mother Earth, this is a feminine symbol or a yonic symbol here. So the orientation of the shape can have an impact on the overall meaning of your design. Here are swastikas. Um, we think of swastikas mainly with uh, a very different connotation here, but actually these are very ancient symbols and they've been used across the world in very different uh, contexts. They are a symbol of divinity and spirituality in various religions, including Hinduism, Buddhism, and Hyenism. Hope I'm saying that right. Um, above, we can see the right-facing um, symbol. This is called a swastika. And below, the left-facing symbol is called a solvastika. Now, it wasn't until the 1930s that the Nazi party adopted this symbol which prior to this had nothing to do with any ideas of anti-Semitism or racism or Aryan national identity or anything like that. Uh, Hitler needed a symbol to use essentially as part of his brainwashing and culture programming um, ideas that helped lead him to gain power uh, in Germany in the 1930s. Um, so the swastika was adopted by the Nazis um, and used to very different ends than what this symbol was originally uh, intended to be used for. So again, a simple change in the orientation 
of a very ancient shape can have drastically different meanings. Uh, if we look at this painting by Carrie James Marshall, Slow Dance from 1992 and 1993, here we have two human figures upright. Uh, they're dancing, obviously, there's music playing. Um, the upright human form is a symbol of life, of vitality, because the upright human form is a shape that is striving against gravity. That striving or pushing against forces is the essence of life, and we understand this in a visual sense. So upright shapes strive against the forces of gravity. Here is where design and symbolism cross over. While the horizontal human form has been used to represent death, resting, uh, here in this case of the dead Toreador by Edward Manet, uh, the eternal rest, uh, here as a dead bullfighter. While we might take that human form and orient it obliquely or diagonally to show a more dynamic relationship between the form and the ground on which it stands, in this case, the diagonal motion of the boxer on the left is used to emphasize his movement towards the boxer in the center. But position can also mean its location on the picture plane. So I'm going to lay on top of this painting our favorite golden mean rectangle again, and we will see that indeed this painting um, is using the golden mean. There is the line of the edge of the boxing ring where all of the spectators heads are on the bottom creating a division that divides the image into a golden mean rectangle on top and where the square break exists in that golden mean rectangle is where you will find the edge of the boxer in the center along with the axis of the referee to his right so the positionality or the location of these objects on the picture plane being determined by proportion breaks by the use of the golden mean rectangle. Uh, if I find the diagonal of the square break of, of that golden mean rectangle, then I will find the orientation and location of my boxer on the left. And if I find the diagonal of the whole golden mean rectangle, I will find a line that is parallel to the referee's arms here, like this. And you'll notice that the intersection of the diagonal of the square and the diagonal of the hole is a powerful location. So using the hidden geometry of the picture plane to tell you where to place objects on that picture plane is a really good idea. These intersection points uh, and proportion breaks are powerful locations on the picture plane. So the positionality of objects on those locations will help you to create a more dynamic image. Here is a painting called The Holy Trinity by Masaccio. It is located in a church and the architecture surrounding this painting actually looks like the architecture that is present in the painting. Um, there's a bit, there's meant to be a bit of a sort of trompe l'oeil effect that Masaccio is pulling off here, where it actually looks like the church is extending into the painting itself. But what I want us to focus on is this figure down here in the bottom. Um, again, the location of this object, of this, uh, we get a close-up image of it, of the skeleton being in the bottom of the picture plane. The bottom has an association with death. And here's a sarcophagus showing that death. So the location or position in the bottom of the picture plane of an object can tell us about death sometimes. Uh, here's another painting by Gustave Courbet, uh, Burial at Ornans from 1849. And you'll notice that there's a very prominent horizon line moving across the top third of the painting, and that there's only one figure in this painting that crosses that horizon line. All of the mourners at this burial are located below the horizon line or in the earth. And the figure of Christ 
um, here, which is part of a staff that one of the clergymen is is holding, is the only figure that crosses that horizon line into the sky or into heaven. Uh, so that the location of these objects on the picture plane, these people and this um, sculpture of Christ, uh, carries meaning due to its location, due to its, due to its positionality, uh, in association with um, the symbolic nature of these objects. This painting is a pretty interesting one. Um, you'll notice the hole where our person is to be buried is located front and center and bottom of this painting. Uh, Corbet here is positioning you, the viewer, um, in the grave. He's telling us exactly where we're all going to end up at the end of this ride. Um, and he is also uh, poking quite a bit of fun at or really more criticizing um, the church and its leadership here. Uh, you'll notice the two men in red above the gentleman who is kneeling down um, at the burial pit. These guys in red, these, uh, I guess they're cardinals, have um, bulbous red noses. They're, they're heavy drinkers. Um, Ornan is where Corbet is from. Um, and so he actually knows a lot of these people in this painting. He is a realist painter. Um, realism here doesn't have anything to do with how natural it looks, how much it looks like real life. That's what we refer to as naturalism. Realism, on the other hand, means that he is depicting society as it really is. Um, so the society here, um, this being a comment on the church and its leadership, these uh, drunkards who then preach and um, judge others um, for sinning and whatnot are known to be uh, drunkards in town. So this location of all of these mourners in the earth with the only um, spiritual, actual spiritual, spiritual figure uh, in the painting uh, crossing over that horizon line into the sky. We've seen this image before. This is from the design test in Maitland Graves' The Art of Color and Design. Uh, and we've talked about um, the way that the weight of the isolated circle on the left can counteract the weight of the two groups, um, larger figures on the right. And so this is an example of proximity. The two figures on the right being grouped closer together um, read more as a single unit. And the circle, which is on the left, isolated by itself, not proximate to the other two figures, um, reads as its own unit. So when we look at a painting like this by Francisco Goya, the 3rd of May, 1808, painted in 1814, uh, we can see two distinct groups. On the right, these are French soldiers, and on the left, these are Spanish citizens, which they are massacring. Um, so there's a very distinct um, contrast that Goya is playing here between these repeated similar shapes on the right and these various and contrasting shapes, but that are unified through their proximity on the left as citizens. Um, here depicting the French troops, the military, as more mechanical in a way. The, their image is repeated four times, four or five times, one after the other, very similarly. There's a uniformity to the, um, to the soldiers. Um, it makes them more of a sort of machination, a, a machine. Um, they are soulless. We can't see their faces. Um, while the citizens um, have very um, expressive faces and we can read their fear here. This painting has inspired um, quite a few other paintings. Um, here is an example of one of them by Edward Manet from 1868 and 69. This is the execution of Emperor Maximilian, the second emperor um, in Mexico. So very similar subject matter, very um, obviously lifted compositional elements um, from Goya here. Uh, Picasso said that, I'm paraphrasing here, but he said something along the lines of 
that amateurs borrow and artists steal. And so in that vein, Picasso uses these compositional elements himself again, um, this time making the soldiers on the right even more mechanical. Uh, this is uh, the massacre in Korea painted in 1951. This is in opposition to America's intervention in the Korean War. Here is a painting you've probably seen before um, by Michelangelo, The Creation of Adam. This is on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican City. Uh, and we have this group surrounding God uh, on the right and this triangular shape on the left of, of the landscape where Adam rests. So these two groupings um, through proximity, all of these these various figures on the right being grouped together in a single unit and Adam in isolation on the left. And there is a balance between these two figures. I'm going to take this image and I'm going to rotate it and I'm going to stretch it out a little bit. And then I'm going to show you this painting by Vasily Kandinsky um, called Black Relationship from 1924. The triangular shape shapes on the bottom right and the prominent circular isolated shape in the top left. Um, very clearly taking a uh, compositional cue from Michelangelo here. And it might be easy to say, you know, okay, I can see some similarities, but it's not like Kand Kandinsky looked at Michelangelo and went and made this drawing. And I'm not saying that that's what he did either, but Kandinsky would have been very aware of Michelangelo's work. Um, when you see these similarities in composition from artist to artist, uh, even across such a wide range in time, from 1512 to 1924, so 412 years, um, artists are aware of their place in time uh, and their relationship to the larger art conversation across time. So here's Kandinsky using this composition from Michelangelo uh, in a new context. And the use of proximity here um, from Tensho Shubun, the mountain landscape from the 15th century, a large grouping of information uh, in the bottom center, as there's a very dense grouping of information here with this tree and the travelers below it, and on the right side as well, but very sparse information, uh, a few wispy mountains in the background on the left there, and a lot of empty negative space in the top quadrants and the, the top left uh, corner as well. So proximity here, creating a dense to sparse relationship. And here, the negative space, the empty area, is just as important as the area with all of the information. Don't be afraid to leave empty space, but that empty space has to have a serious weight to it. Uh, in, in this case, it does. The way that the negative space moves in and out of the positive forms locks the forms together. Um, and there is this, this tension between the emptiness, which has its own characteristic, and the, the densely populated uh, elements in the, the bottom, center, and the right there. Here's another example of that from Endo Hiroshige. Uh, this landscape, this is a detail from a sketchbook of his, um, where you have this sort of circular positionality of information, um, but that the center is left empty. The center is your most powerful location. And throughout this lecture, we've looked at a lot of images, and all of them capture the center in different ways. Here in this uh, drawing, the center is captured by putting information around the center. We might put information directly in the center to capture the center, 
But the positionality of the center being where all of the most of the tension in the image is located, you don't want to put things necessarily directly dead center. There is a location slightly to the right and slightly higher than center that is a more powerful location. It is a dynamic center rather than a literal dead center. Um, this is because if you took a line, any line, a uh, horizontal line, and you were asked to bisect it to find the, the center of that line, you will, without a doubt, place it a little bit to the right of the actual center. This has to do with the way that we read from left to right. We've discussed this before, um, where in films, the protagonist is usually shown traveling from left to right, and the antagonist is shown traveling from right to left. So we kind of speed up in the, the left, and then the right is things are read to be heavier um, in the right in, ter in terms of balance. So we put that dividing line, if we're asked to divide our imaginary horizontal line here, just a little bit to the right of actual center. In the same way, this will happen if you're asked to bisect a vertical line. You'll place that dividing point just a little bit above center on that line. So taking that, expanding that idea out to the two-dimensional plane here, if you can find a location that is slightly to the right and slightly above center, that is a more dynamic location to place something centrally than just dead center. Or you can take a page out of this Japanese landscape drawing here and actually put objects around the center, spiraling or circling around the center to capture the center without actually placing any object in the center at all. And so we've discussed position in terms of orientation, in terms of location on the picture plane, and in terms of proximity of objects, either further away or closer together to one another. And with that, let's look at your homework. Studio problem number 11, using variable line weight in a root 2 format, create a unity of shape with a modulation of position. Are you going to modulate that position in terms of its orientation or modulate it in terms of its location on the picture plane or modulate it in terms of its proximity? Create 10 thumbnails with 10 variations and give me a final mounted design. This week, you'll only have one lecture from me. I know that you're probably rejoicing about that, um, but that is because on Thursday is your portfolio work day. Um, you are to have all of your designs properly mounted in your sketchbook and photograph all of these designs. Any feedback that I've left for you in our discussion board posts, you need to take that into consideration. And if I'm telling you that things aren't working in your design, then it's a good idea to try to solve those studio problems again. Give it a second chance before you turn in your interim portfolio. Um, if you do that, if you decide that, you know, you didn't do so hot on studio problem number four and seven, and that you need to try them again, that doesn't mean throw away your original attempts. Keep those in your sketchbook as well, but also submit a new attempt at the design so that there's a history of your progression. Um, hopefully, the progression goes from worse to better as you improve across the course of the semester. We definitely don't want to go from um, doing well in the beginning and slacking off. Um, as you go along, that's not going to do well for your grade. It's important to keep in mind that I'm, I'm going to be grading you against yourself. So if I see, if I do see that positive progression from earlier designs to later, that's good for you. I'm not going to be grading you against your classmates or anything. It's, it's always graded against yourself in this case. But again, if I've left feedback and told you that, you know, that you're not doing things properly or that you're not using the right format uh, or anything else, you really need to go back and do these problems again. Because if I see the same problems turned in in your interim portfolio that I left you feedback about, 
and the discussion boards, that's, that's not going to do you any favors in terms of your grade. You want to make sure that your presentation is top notch, clean edges, clean cut edges, no shaky hands on the scissors. Um, use a paper cutting shop if, if you need to, to get that straight edge. Um, no rubber cement boogers left on the, on the surface of the design. Uh, you need to take good photographs straight on. No, at, no pictures taken at an angle to create uh, trapezoids. Um, you need to present this as strongly as you can because I've said this a hundred times, but presentation is all that you have in art and design. And if you can't present this the strongest way that, that you can, then you're not going to get a good grade. I want to see good borders on these final designs when you turn them in for your portfolio review. Um, that means clean borders of at least two inches all the way around. You might have a bottom border of two and a half inches to try to free it from gravity a little bit. But these one inch borders or where you're taking, some, some of you guys are just taking full sheets of black construction paper and slapping your design down in the center of it without cutting the borders evenly. That's not gonna fly. If you're not following the guidelines that I've provided you, you're not gonna get a good grade. So make sure that all of your designs are up to snuff, and that's what you'll, you'll need to be working on uh, for the rest of the week. You will have another studio problem on Thursday, but I won't be giving you another lecture to mull over. If you have any questions, shoot me an email.